Hello, everybody. Uh, this may be the last presentation on the official program other than the special session, so uh, we're, oh, better? Yes. Okay, uh, we're near the end. Uh, I'll be presenting today uh, an introduction and progress report on the uh, Lenria Experimental and Analysis Program. Uh, that's a project of uh, Lenria, the Industry Association. Uh, our strategy uh, for the program is to perform the same Lenner experiment that has been qualified to produce excess heat at multiple major laboratories. Uh, we'll produce reports on the conduct and results of the experiments at each laboratory. We'll then coordinate simultaneous publication of the reports in a major scientific journal. Our goal is a change of perception of Lenner by the scientific community for very important people, government agencies, and the public. The, the multi-lab program, uh, which is now called LEAP, was conceived in 2013. Since then, we've examined experimental options for the program. Uh, last year, in 2016, we decided to base the program on the electrochemical loading of PD boron alloys, in particular uh, the experiments of uh, Dr. Melvin Miles, uh, based on the materials of uh, Dr. Imam. Uh, in recent months, we have been acquiring and testing equipment to produce a modern turnkey automated system. Uh, the program has three phases. Uh, the, during the first phase, uh, the first thing to do is to rerun the PDB excess heat experiment, uh, which we've done, and uh, we're uh, in the midst of analysis of the data, uh, to procure uh, new PD cathode material to uh, include in the replicated experiments, and uh, we've accomplished that. I'll explain that in more detail later and uh, to develop hardware and software for the program, and we're well along uh, in, in that process. Uh, phase two starts with uh, documenting the LEAP experiments, uh, procure funding for the second phase, and to clone the experiments to make a, a proper number of experiments. Uh, once they're cloned, then um, we'll, we'll be placing uh, the experiments in uh, major international and uh, U.S. laboratories. Uh, uh, for them to conduct the experiments. Uh, we'll have the option, uh, if we think it's useful, of allowing these laboratories to exchange cathodes, uh, if we feel uh, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, the laboratories will present their papers uh, to review committee, the, and the review committee will uh, coordinate a simultaneous publication uh, in a major journal, and uh, if, if warranted, there'll be a, a media campaign uh, to get the word out uh, about results to the public and to government agencies. Uh, as we've gone through consideration of, of experimental candidates for the LEAP program, we uh, started uh, to have a conversation with uh, Dr. Miles. Uh, and during that process, he suggested his PDB experiments because of their high reproducibility, uh, the reproducibility he had experienced when he conducted those. Uh, so if we go into a Jed Rothwell's paper, uh, that summarized uh, Dr. Miles' um, uh, experiments, uh, we can see a table of uh, the, the various experiments he did. And as we move through, uh, right at the top of this list uh, is the NRL PD B alloy experiments. That they had a result of seven out of eight, and that was published. Um, but that's not the end, because uh, Mel did a PDB experiment at NHE in Japan. And that was published, so we now have uh, eight out of nine with NHE uh, Japan and Sapporo uh, published successes uh, with this particular uh, experiment. Uh, if we want to break it down, we can go into a, a paper of Mel's uh, where he summarized all his experiments, and we can, we can break out uh, just the PDB experiments. And uh, what we have uh, are eight experiments uh, Dr. Imam created three types of PDB. He created a 0.25% PDB, he created a 0.5% PDB, and he created 0.75% PDB. Uh, two out of two of the 0.25% uh, PDB experiments were successful. Two of the 0.5% uh, uh, experiments were successful. And three out of four of the 0.75% uh, experiments were successful. And we can note that of the one cathode that did not work, Dr. Miles uh, reported being able to observe uh, defects in the, in the cathode material. There was a fold over. It was not a minor defect. It was something that was very visible. So to these uh, uh, eight experiments, seven out of eight that were successful, we can add uh, the NHE experiment. We can add an NRL experiment that's uh, not well known. 
uh, and we can add uh, the replication that we just did, which will give us a total of uh, 10 out of 11 experiments uh, that were successful using uh, this material. So we feel this is a solid experimental base uh, behind the experiment that we chose. Uh, many of you are familiar uh, with Dr. Miles' uh, HE4 to heat correlation experiments, and this is more or less a sidebar, but I did want to point out that um, of those set of experiments, one of those experiments was in fact with the PDB cathode. It was the 0.75% cathode. Um, and uh, that particular cathode, which was one of a set, actually produced the largest excess power uh, uh, in that set of experiments, in the, in the HE4 uh, heat correlation. So a little bit of a sidebar, but I thought it was interesting. Um, uh, we earlier discussed the NHE experiment that Mel did. Uh, he was in uh, Sapporo, Japan, uh, in the New Hydrogen Energy Laboratory, NHE, uh, for work sponsored by the New Energy Development Organization. He was there from October 97 to uh, March 1998. Uh, here's a, uh, the, the NEDO final report of Mel's work. Uh, he conducted four types of experiments there. Uh, he did uh, palladium, pure palladium cathodes. He did palladium alloy cathodes. He did co-deposition, which was something we were interested in at one point, and he did fluidized bed experiments in cells. Um, I, I, if you're curious, that's something worth looking up. It's a very interesting experiment. Uh, but we're interested in the palladium alloy. So let's go to that section of the paper. I'll uh, try to pull out the information we need out of this dense paragraph. Uh, but essentially, he conducted three experiments using PD uh, alloys. Uh, the one we're interested in is the PD uh, 0 0.5. Uh, cathode. That cathode was 4.71 uh, millimeters by 20.1 millimeters, and it was uh, designated as A2. Uh, the results were published. Here's, here's the graph of the results. Uh, you can see that, uh, there's, you know, it's a, little, it's a little, little bit noisy, but you can see that the maximum uh, excess power achieved was a little over uh, 250 uh, milliwatts. Uh, we, f we feel that's good, and uh, uh, that a result like this could uh, be a good candidate for the, uh, for the LEAP program. Um, let me go back one. Uh, so Mel had uh, let us know that he thought he had the A2 cathode from the NHE experiment. And uh, that, that's a big benefit because we wouldn't have to create any material. And also we'd have the ability, the ability to do a qualification experiment to determine whether uh, this material still worked and to, to make sure everything was right. Um, Mel looked for it after our discussions for a few weeks. He couldn't find it. Uh, you know, he, he had pretty much gone through most of his stuff. There were still a couple places of the house he couldn't get to. So he invited me up uh, to see him in uh, Ridgecrest. Uh, Ridgecrest uh, is the home of the China, China Lake Naval Air Weapons Station uh, where, well, where Mel worked as an electrochemist and researcher at, at the labs there. It's, it's about two and a half hours uh, from where I am. So I headed up to uh, Ridgecrest. Uh, this is a view of the town from up on the hill. Uh, it's pretty much in the middle of a desert, and you see a lot of planes flying back and forth for the Naval Air Station. Uh, here's Mel, uh, part of our extracurricular activities. We actually, uh, he actually got me into the Naval Weapons uh, Station, and it was, it was a kind of an interesting uh, experience. So I'm visiting Mel, I'm there for about two days. We uh, go through everything. We go through attics, we go through boxes, we go through closets, we go through file cabinets, we go through chests, we looked everywhere. And uh, we pretty much came up blank. Uh, we, had one, we had some disappointments, we had, in one of the boxes we found uh, a PDB uh, uh, 0.5B vial that was empty. It was very disappointing. We thought it might have been lost. Uh, but at the end of the process, while Mel was actually um, uh, loading back up the last box, and I was about to leave in about an hour because I wanted to try to get a start before dark, uh, I decided to look in the garage where we were on the apron of the garage and, and try to see what we were missing. And what I saw is Mel had a habit of uh, putting things on the cross braces between the uh, studs in his garage. Uh, so it obviously wasn't there, but I, you know, I looked down through the garage. I saw you know, he had been uh, you know, practicing that. Uh, hadn't really noticed that. We were busy tearing apart boxes. But as I walked down the garage, uh, beyond the beam, there I see three vials sitting on a shelf. So uh, picked them up. You know, looked, it looked like a promising candidate. Brought them over to Mel. Mel thought, uh, you know, it looks like these were what we were looking for. Uh, we brought them inside, uh, took a closer look. 
And there we go. We have the uh, NHEA2 cathode, which is what we were looking for so that we can uh, start the process. Mel had mentioned that uh, these vials may have been sitting on that shelf for 10 years, that when he moved into the house or moved out of his lab, he uh, probably took them out of a box for safekeeping, put them on the shelf, and uh, had forgot he had done that, and uh, they were just sitting there. So these, uh, these have been buried since uh, 19, you know, 97 or whatever year uh, that was. So in the weeks that followed, uh, you know, we started to uh, uh, put the, um, or Mel started to put the experiment together. Here he's added a lead uh, to the cathode. This is a nickel lead. Uh, he happened to have that uh, in stock, you know, in his materials. The NHE experiment was a platinum lead, but uh, all the China Lake experiments were nickel leads, so we thought this would be a reasonable compromise. Um, to my surprise, uh, in Mel's garage, he has a very nice uh, arc welder. I don't think that's uh, something we all have in our garage, so we didn't have to send it out, and he, you know, he practiced on some uh, blank material for a while to, to get his skills back up to speed, and then he uh, was able to um, uh, get, get things going. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we needed, uh, he had asked for a um, cathode base for the cell. Uh, this was something new or different than he had used before. He had specced, uh, specced out what he wanted. Dave Nagel uh, used the GWU lab, GWU lab to, uh, not lab, the GWU machine shop to create this. We shipped it out to Mel. Uh, and he began assembling the cell. Here's some uh, close-ups uh, of the cell. Uh, so now we're ready to begin. So here's, here's Mel's uh, equipment list. Mel has uh, older but high-quality equipment. Uh, one of the issues for us going forward is it's not automated. It's not PC-driven. What Mel does is he goes to his house in Ridgecrest. He runs the experiment during waking hours. He records his data every hour or so. and. Uh, goes to sleep and then uh, wakes up the next day. We would like to run it 24-7 and, and, and have uh, as little operator intervention as necessary uh, so that the, the labs will be uh, more interested in taking it so they don't have as much overhead to run it. So just a quick overview. He runs a Princeton Applied Research 362 uh, potentiostat galvanostat. He runs a Cole Palmer thermistor thermometer, five channels. He runs a GW digital multimeter, and he runs a, a Techni uh, 10D uh, circulator bath. Uh, so here's his setup. I don't know if this was our experiment or if this was the, the China experiment, uh, but you can see it running. I don't have a close-up of the calorimeter, but in the bath you can see it. It's, a, it's his custom calorimeter. It's a copper tube. It's you know Home Depot materials, essentially. Uh, there's an inner and an outer. He likes it. Uh, I wish I could show you uh, something uh, closer, but that's, that's pretty much what I have. Uh, for that calorimeter, here are his equations. Uh, these are the equations he presented in uh, China at SICCF20 uh, for, for the, to, to represent the experiments he did there. Uh, so here are preliminary results, uh, not as much as we had wanted, and, and these are not complete. Uh, this does not include uh, the power due to gases exiting the cell, and Mel feels this will add up to 20 milliwatts uh, excess power. There's some things that happened in the cell that we think uh, were problematic, and, and we'll solve those the next time, so we're hoping to have a, a much better result. Uh, I'm, including, I'm including this picture uh, uh, for the reason that I think it helps to validate uh, our approach to this uh, experimental regime, which is to institutional, institutionalize the replication of these experiments. Uh, what you can see here are bubbles coming from under, under the base and from uh, between the cathode and the base. This you might consider to be the most mundane, simple part, that it's a no-brainer, that it couldn't create any problem. And here we are with this most simple, piece potentially creating a, a situation where we had adverse conditions that might have limited uh, our experience. So I, I think Mike may have mentioned it or someone else that uh, if, if you have an experimentalist build this, there's a hundred ways to make a mistake. I think Mike mentioned yesterday that we're not replicating these things you know, perfectly. So uh, if we can make our mistakes, fix our mistakes, and then put these things together so they arrive, uh, so the variables are very limited, I think it, I think it helps our, um, uh, our probability for success. Um, so Mel says, Dr. Eamon's PDB cathodes have now shown excess heat using four different calorimeters. There's the China Lake calorimeter for the seven out of eight. There's the uh, NRL CBAC. Uh, that was an unusual experiment, but there's that one. There's the FP Dewar NHE, and there's uh, Mel's Ridgecrest copper calorimeter. Uh, I was talking to, to Mike uh, McCubra during the week, and he mentioned that SRI had run uh, Dr. Imam's PDB cathodes and had seen a small amount of excess heat, but they had seen it, and uh, they used uh, their own CBEC calorimeter. So here's, here, that would mean Dr. Imam's PDB cathodes have now shown excess heat in five different calorimeters. Uh, as far as Landria development, um, we have a lab bench 
in uh, Los Angeles, and then Dave has uh, his Leonard Lab in Washington, D.C. Uh, the, 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 the Leonard Lab, in, not, it's not really a lab, but the Leonard set up in, um, or the lab bench in Los Angeles is pretty much the front run the equipment to try to uh, establish what's needed, what works, what looks like uh, can be integrated, so I'm trying to front run some of that. The heavy lifting will be done in Washington at Dave's Leonard Lab, where integration, you know, further evaluation and software development uh, is going to take place. So here's, here's the setup in, in Los Angeles. Uh, we've gone through you know, some older equipment, some newer equipment. Uh, our latest iteration is uh, uh, on top. On the left is a, um, a DC supply. We're still learning about DC supplies. Uh, this one may not work. We may have to go for something different. On the right is a data acquisition and logger. It's a, it's a very interesting unit. It has a DMM built in. It reads temperatures. It reads uh, voltage, current, resistance, everything, and logs it. Um, and we're very big in, uh, in the California side of the operation on kitchens. Uh, we like using kitchens. Um, uh, we'll also be using, uh, we believe we'll be using an all-in-one computer with a very large screen, which will go along with the experiments for data logging and for control of the experiments. Uh, as far as software, um, we're, we're, we're pretty sure we're going to be using LabVIEW. It's very powerful. You can create very simple interfaces for the user. Uh, it's an expensive product, but there's license available through, uh, through GWU where we have access to the program. There's students there to code it. Um, uh, one advantage is with LabVIEW, you can create an application and you can distribute it as runtime. So for the, you know, the six or eight instances of the experiment, we don't have to worry about license. We can uh, download a runtime mo module and distribute uh, the application we created for free. We are looking at an alternative, uh, but I think it's a very low probability. It's called BenchView. It's from Keysight Technologies. Uh, it allows you to uh, operate your instruments with a virtual interface. Uh, in the last, in, in, the re in some recent time frame, they've added something called TestFlow, which allows drag and drop uh, automated sequences with do loops and conditions and other things. You know, my sense is from playing with it that you could, we could put together an experimental sequence with this in, in a day, you know, and learn it in a few hours, but it, it won't be as user friendly for the end user. You won't be hitting, you know, buttons with your mouse. You would have to actually operate it. Um, as far as um, material uh, for the distributed uh, experiments, uh, we thought we were going to have to create PDB. We thought we'd have to create new material, even having the A2 cathode and qualifying it, uh, which is fine because Dr. Imam, who created the original material, is on the team. However, however fortuitously, uh, we've, we've um, obtained a historical ingot. This is an ingot uh, that was made and was part of the original batches of the PDB that were represented in the tables and the papers that I showed you earlier. Um, uh, if we made new PDB, it might work, but it adds, it, it adds a variable, it adds an unknown. We don't know if this is a magical material, maybe it is. It, um, but in any case, we think having the original material is, uh, increases our probability for success. Uh, we need to send it out to be swaged uh, and, um, uh, and, and into rod and, and turned into cathodes. Uh, with the amount of material that we have, if we create uh, cathodes of the diameter of the NHE experiment, which are 4.7 millimeter, we'll have 20, approximately 20 units. If we make uh, cathodes with a 3 millimeter diameter, which is not an unusual diameter for these experiments, we'll have about 49 units. So um, uh, if we need six or eight for the program, maybe there's some duds, um, but we should have a, a significant number left over. So even though this is not a discovery program, this can, tur can turn into a discovery program, uh, if we have success and we can distribute these cathodes to experimentalists uh, in the future to, to work with them for, for scientific uh, purposes and not perception change purposes. Um, here's quadrants of performance. Um, Mike, uh, I think, mentioned a little bit this yesterday. If you're going to do an experiment where you want to change perception or convince people, I think we want to be in the upper right-hand corner, high power, high gain. Uh, we don't have that experiment. Um, we're moving towards reproducibility. And it turns out that the reproducible experiment that we have is in the lower uh, left grid, which is still good. Um, but with the success of this program, we were hoping we'd have a strong enough result that the program itself could uh, create uh, the tipping point and the change of perception on its own. Uh, the information will be good. It'll be convincing. That, it might not be enough to change everything, but we believe it will be enough to begin the change of perception uh, that is necessary. And because we have uh, the multiple labs and everyone coming together uh, you know, in a very organized way with very competent people, we think it's going to introduce reputational risk to critics. 
so that the folks who typically um, uh, come out of the woodwork and unthoughtfully criticize these experiments will have to think twice about it. We want critics, we want, you know, we want skeptics, we want um, uh, thoughtful thinking, but it will, it will, it will make people who do so um, uh, in a knee-jerk way to think twice because if there's, there's six uh, or eight labs that are spread out across the world with a good reputation, if they criticize this and they don't do it in a thoughtful way, it's their reputation that becomes at risk. Uh, here's some pictures of our collaborators. Here's Dr. Miles and Dr. Imam with Martin Fleischmann. This picture was in a paper they did together um, regarding the PDB alloys. Uh, here's a good photo of uh, Dr. Nagel uh, in, in uh, San Leandro uh, from back in the day. <laughs> I'll put that back up again for a minute. You, you gotta. <laughs> <laughs> A classic. Uh, in any case, progress. Uh, we've, conceived the, we've conceived of the program. We've identified the experiment on which to base the program. We've completed the first qualification experiment. And we've gone the process of equipment modernization. Uh, as far as our plans, uh, we, we, we still need to complete all aspects of the system. That includes hardware, software, materials, and protocol. Uh, once we have everything in hand, we'll seek funding to clone the system, but we will get uh, one instance up uh, and running. Uh, and in, power, in parallel, we shall seek agreements with major laboratories to perform and document uh, the experiment on a specified time scale. And we've already had some preliminary and informal conversations with some potential destinations. Um, thank you for your attention. I have a small um, remark, actually, about the acquisition system you're using. And we've been discussing that um, privately with National Instruments. Um, uh, Keysight is not um, also um, uh, very aware of that. But when you're switching uh, between, Francesco knows that very much. Um, when you're using a switching unit with relays, um, uh, and you have a power supply that is uh, um, said current driven, it's actually not really current driven. It's compensated by a DAC, a 16 big DAC back and on. And um, you have a control loop inside. So when you're uh, driving current and changing suddenly by switching with the switching um, data acquisition unit you have, you will have some um, uh, transilient factor in it and it might give you a wrong value. So it's I'm just... I'm not sure we'll be it. switching uh, power with, with the uh, data acquisition and switching it. I think the power will go directly from whatever DC supply we use into... Um, it's not that. It's, okay. uh, measuring a voltage well, is non-intrusive. Okay. Measuring a current is. Okay. I, we'll, we'll talk about it after because we, yeah, we could talk further. Yeah, I was curious if uh, you're going to measure any other signatures other than just heat. You didn't say anything about it. Uh, th this is just looking for heat. Just looking for heat. Additional questions? 